Bentley here. Good evening to you. On behalf of the Calgary Climate Hub, I welcome you to a Climate of Change, our weekly live cast exploring with thought leaders from across Canada what this wildly unprecedented moment in history means for our province, this country, the economic system, and specifically the climate crisis. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Pekani, the Tutina, the Iaxi Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation of Region 3, and all people who make their home in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I'd also like to make a second land acknowledgement on behalf of another group of folks that have a stake in this land that we stand on today, and that is our children our nieces and nephews and grandchildren, and all future generations. I urge you to keep them in mind during this time and as we face unprecedented change and start making decisions about what comes next. I also want to quickly thank our sponsor, Skyfire Energy, who we'll talk, I'll talk about again a little later on in the show. Uh, for those of you watching via Facebook Live, please feel free to post some questions for our guest. As well, for the folks participating in the Zoomcast, please post your questions using the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Should you wish me to not say your name, please type the word anonymous before your question, as this show will be shared to our social networks. Otherwise, we will assume your consent in the use of your name in the broadcast. Tonight's guest is climate change expert and Canada's best known clean energy venture capitalist, Tom Rand, whose latest book is entitled The Case for Climate Capitalism, Economic Solutions for a Climate in Crisis. On a personal note, I've been a fan of Tom since his book, Waking the Frog. I think the work his fund, Arcturn Ventures does is absolutely critical path for clean energy in Canada. Tom Rand, welcome to A Climate of Change. Thanks very much for having me. So Tom, I'm just going to give you the floor. Tell us where we're at. Sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll share the screen a little bit if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I think this should get it going. Um, so I, you know, obviously I would love to be there uh, in person. Um, you know, it's a great time to be in Calgary, but obviously that's changed. Uh, and COVID has changed everything. COVID is an example of what I would call uh, a systemic risk. And a systemic risk is something that it sort of is in the background. Uh, experts maybe worry about it, um, but it's sort of, you can brush it aside for a period of time and it slowly builds up over time. And when it finally emerges, everything changes, our social lives, our economy, everything. Um, so that's what I mean by systemic risk. It, sh it, it sort of shifts the boundary conditions under which our daily lives operate. It shatters a bunch of assumptions we, we make that allow our, our, our sort of everyday lives to be what they are. And in the case of COVID, of course, I mean, there's kind of a, an invisible line between us and the micro world um, that was shattered and it's now dangerous to us again. Um, the good news, of course, on COVID is we see massive behavioral change um, uh, as we all sort of change our behavior for the common good. Um, and of course, we will see technology come running to the rescue in the form of a vaccine at some point. So as, as horrid as COVID may be and as inconvenient as it may be, it's a bump in the road. It's, it's a one-time event and we will come out the other side perfectly fine. We will have a lot of government debt to deal with, there will be dislocation and so on, but it's not gonna really derail what, what we do. Um, our response to COVID is of course um, a moral one. Um, the costs we took on in the blink of an eye uh, on the public side to sort of deal with these risks and, and keep workers safe and enable people to stay home and so on, we did that in the blink of an eye. We didn't really put it into a spreadsheet to do a cost benefit analysis. We just did what we needed to do to protect ourselves. And the public sector is the kind of the arbiter of that moral response. It defines the framework by which we respond. And it, it alone can provide the foundation upon which the economy can recover. So that's kind of COVID. If you squint at COVID, it looks a little bit like climate risk in the sense that for sure, Climate risk is the mother of systemic risks. We're talking about shifting the boundary conditions under which our civilization evolved, that dictated where and how we grow food and get water, where our cities are and so on. Um, and the big difference, of course, though, is that it's not a temporary change. We don't recover from climate. If we get that systemic risk wrong, it's a one-way road. There's no, there's no coming back. Um, the good news is we found largely um, certainly in Canada, the, the normal divisions between left and right politically don't seem to matter as much anymore. We have, you know, the Premier of Ontario, Ford, working with Trudeau. No one ever would have thought that was possible. Well, that's because the public will not tolerate 
a leadership that doesn't keep them safe from a systemic risk. Now, of course, the big difference between COVID and climate is one would argue that COVID feels very immediate, right? That's why we responded the way we did. That's why it's not a political issue. Climate's much further away. It's, you know, it's not our, our aunt and our grandmother and our kids we're worried about. It's, our, it's someone in the distant future. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know that, that climate risk look, looks all that distant to people in Fort McMurray when those fires raged through that town. It doesn't look all that distant to people in Australia. Um, so I'm not sure it's quite as distant as, as one may think. I think it's becoming quite real. But for sure, the big difference though for me is climate, failure on climate lasts forever. And the problem is you can't invent a vaccine in response to climate risk. Once it, it, hit, it hits and we change these systemic boundary conditions, you can't post hoc invent a vaccine, which is what we can do for COVID. So we have to, we have to anticipate climate risk and we have to build a vaccine in advance. And that's really what climate capitalism is. That's what people have been talking about policy around climate for a long time. As it relates to COVID, it's essentially it's a, it's a vaccine in advance. I'm going to return to that metaphor in a moment because I, I think it's important. Um, look, you don't, you don't have to be kind of a, a Che Guevara fan to appreciate that the current economic system is taking us right off a climate cliff. Nor do you have to be kind of a Wall Street titan to understand that market forces, capital, large corporations, uh, these are some of the most powerful uh, tools in our toolkit to deal with any sort of problem. And it wouldn't be uh, an extremist notion. As a matter of fact, I would argue it's a very centrist notion politically that you use the most powerful tools you have to solve the most wicked problems that you have. So the point of this book, the, the point of the first part of this talk, which I'll, I'll go through quite quickly, is really to make the point that traditional arguments between the left and the right don't make any sense when it comes to climate. Somehow we've locked into this debate where it is a political issue. But I'm gonna argue from a number of perspectives, it's not. Um, and one of the reasons that I wrote this, book, I was frustrated by the far left who somehow are equating capitalism with the climate problem itself, right? That they're somehow equated and only by ditching capitalism can you resolve the climate problem. And I find that utterly incoherent for a couple of reasons I'll get into. But at the same time, uh, those who would defend the status quo, um, you know, uh, would prefer we nibble around the edges on climate and are not yet endorsing the kind of radical changes we need to make. And so I find that to be equally a distraction. But when you talk about throwing out capitalism, if, if it's represented by the Koch brothers, if it's represented by Rupert Murdoch and the kind of neoliberal um, uh, dystopia that, that the, a fully free market can become, if there's such a thing as a fully free market, it doesn't look that absurd to want to throw capitalism. As a matter of fact, if Naomi Klein's target were neoconservative, laissez fair capitalism, fine, have at it. I would agree with that premise. Um, but it's a much broader attack. And I think we waste a lot of time and a lot of effort putting climate into a bucket where it's on a par with the economic system that we have uh, as a whole. And I find it very unhelpful. Um, the reason I find it unhelpful is that you, you sort of, it doesn't give our economic system the variability that it has. Capitalism means different things to different people. It's not necessarily evil. It's not necessarily good. And historically takes many different, many different forms. I mean, to a person who it might mean the right to own your own bakery. To another person, it might mean the right to have options in a tech startup uh, and, and become rich. It might mean someone having a retirement account and expecting their RRSP to pay for their meals and rent when they get old. It's all of these things and more. It's really sort of the way we've organized economic behavior for a very, very long time. On this view, um, you know, American freestyle capitalism is but one form. Uh, there's no predetermined role for the public sector. There's no predetermined sanctity of capital either. On this notion, Sweden is as much a capitalist country as the United States. The United States didn't become a less capitalist country because of the New Deal. So it doesn't limit the public sector's kind of role in shaping the rules that, by which market dynamics occur. So I think one impoverishes the debate by blaming capitalism for, for climate. Um, there are reasons why people might want to, and I'll get to those in, in a moment. But the real problem, I think, for, for ditching capitalism is we live in a democracy. And in a democracy, you have to build a big tent to get something done. And if you want to equate climate with capitalism itself, you then you essentially are asking for la revolution as policy. And if in Canada, we can't get a carbon neutral revenue price without it being politically contentious, the notion that we're going to get policy equivalent to la revolution is absolutely and fundamentally absurd. And it, absorbs, it, it, it misses out all the real, the hard work that needs to be done, 
which is making people that don't necessarily agree with you act on the issue that you find important. And if you want to act on climate, but dumping it in with a criticism of capitalism doesn't build you the big tent or the consensus that you need to get public policy done. It also happens to leave in the ditch most of the most powerful forces that we have at our disposal, which is trillions and trillions of dollars of private capital sloshing around. I mean, if Wall Street is so powerful it can burn the planet, it's powerful enough to save the planet, and we live in a democracy where the rules by which that capital flows is, is provided by us, the people. And that's the fundamental challenge. So I think it's incoherent to throw out capitalism, but I also think it's in equally incoherent to say, we're gonna deal with this issue by nibbling around the edges and tinkering with our economic system. So I'm differentiating political extremism from economic extremism. And I'm saying to the business community, right now there's a target on your back. Capitalism looks like a good uh, thing to blame for our environmental ills. And the far left is making a pretty good case that, that capitalism should have that target on its back. The next populist that comes along when bread is $20 a loaf because we have droughts in three countries simultaneously, which is going to happen at some point, the po that populist may not be so amenable to the status quo. And so I think it is incumbent upon business leaders to get in front of this issue and to acknowledge the radical interventions we, requi we require in our economy without necessarily labeling it politically extreme. And that's kind of what I'm talking about when I talk about um, climate capitalism. It's a economically radical but politically centrist set of solutions for the problems that we face, in particular the climate problem. So the notion that capitalism is one thing or another is unhelpful. It comes in as many forms as there are countries and cultures. It changes over time and space. And it is not limited to one thing. It is up to our imagination and our sets of laws that create a kind of capitalism that can solve this problem. And so that's kind of where, where I sit. It's important to sort of ask then, well, what is it that we mean? Well, at its heart, of course, there's a notion of private capital, there's a notion of market forces, um, but it, it's not monolithic and it doesn't have sort of one view. And so what I wanna do is paint a picture where we simply need to ask the question, having left our dogma at the door, whether it's right or left, and simply ask the question, what are the pragmatic tools that we have in our economy that can put a cork in emissions? Those that put a cork in emissions, we'll use them. Those that don't, we won't. And just get on with the task at hand. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm positioning this. Now, I wouldn't want to suggest there are legitimate differences between the left and the right. What I'm trying to make the case for, though, is that climate risk is a meta issue that transcends the traditional sets of things that the left and right traditionally disagree about. And if you look at the left and right, it goes back a long way, right? This is a picture of the French um, uh, parliament, and it goes back to sort of the French Revolution. The left was, stood for, they were on the left-hand side of, of, of the room, and they stood for kind of an activist government, helping poor fight for social justice. Um, they cared about fairness and so on, and critics saw a kind of a utopian idealism. On the right were those sort of royalists who, uh, stood for social stability. They preferred incremental change to radical change, um, personal responsibility and all that kind of stuff. And critics saw an ill-disguised uh, defense of the privileged. And the, the division of labor between left and right has largely taken on those forms over a long period of time. On theoretical grounds, there have been arguments between Hayek and Keynes about the role of government in terms of providing fiscal stimulus. That's a theoretical discussion that sort of is independent of climate. Um, but the, the core of the debate, if both sides are arguing in good faith, is really just a disagreement about how to make the world a better place, right? Um, the less criticism has always had real bite when it comes to inequality, injustice, poverty, the, the propensity of the market to treat the environment like an open sewer. Those are real problems, and the left have, has always had and purported to have better solutions for those problems. Um, on the right, there's always been talk about personal responsibility, um, the capacity of markets to raise living standards, the capacity of markets to organize complex behavior, and the right are correct about that. So those pieces aside, climate is, is essentially a risk that overrides those traditional differences. Acknowledging capitalism as flaws, acknowledging the left has a point when it comes to social justice, acknowledging the right has a point when it comes to economic development, is simply a reflection of the complexity of human life. And we can each pick and choose from the right and the left what we think our favorite solutions might be. 
but climate risk itself is external to the, th the theoretical framework that one wants to defend. It's a meta issue. Neither side has a lock on solutions and neither side, and either side has something of value to offer. The theoretical stakes in terms of your political identification, whether you identify the left or the right or the center, couldn't mean less when it comes to climate, which is kind of a meta issue, right? Um, and that's the kind of the point that I'm, that I'm making. Now, the rubber hits the road for a lot of people when we talk about growth. That's the reason many on the left say it's capitalism's fault because capitalism requires endless growth in a finite world. Um, how does that work? And therefore, it must be the economic system that requires growth. I would first point out, before I get into growth itself, there is no economic system that I'm aware of in history or in the world today that doesn't take growth as a precept, whether it was Soviet Russia, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Sweden, there is no economy, there is no society that I know that doesn't have growth to the capacity they're able to achieve it kind of embedded in their framework. Growth is kind of a natural thing. Now, is, there, is it possible to grow forever on a finite planet? I think it's a really interesting question. And I think in the decades to come, we're gonna to have to figure it out. But one's attitude to growth is a, is a good proxy for one's attitude to capitalism as a whole. Some people think, we can kind of dematerialize the economy, right? You know, energy from the sun, and we rearrange molecules in ever more complex ways with a fully circular economy, and you embed more value in those molecules as they get more complicated, and in that way, you can grow the economy forever. In theory, that's probably right, but that's not really what the world is doing when they think of growth. The developing world wants tuna, they want TVs, they want cars, they want energy. So the notion that we're gonna dematerialize is a theoretical thing that we might deal with in, in, in many, many decades. But the trick to growth is this, it's been an argument between uh, the Club of Rome, for example, that talked about limits to growth, finite world, infinite growth problem, math doesn't work. And those sort of techno-optimists who always saw human ingenuity as being essentially infinite, and human ingenuity would find a way through every barrier to growth. And it would normally work like this. Something gets scarce and is an impediment to growth. Human ingenuity, driven by the rising price of the thing that becomes scarce, is incented to invent an alternative. That alternative replaces what gets scarce, and you burst through that ceiling. We did it in the Green Revolution. We've done it a number of times. Those are kind of the natural antibodies of the economic system to deal with scarcity and to allow growth to continue. The problem with, with climate is that we have to get a way to stop burning fossil fuels before they become scarce. If oil went to $400, $500 a barrel, Canada would have a lot of emissions, but the world would have very few emissions because we would find a way to, to, to replace oil because it'd be an economic incentive to do that. The problem is that we have to find those antibodies in advance because we can't rely on the price signals of scarcity to drive innovation to replace fossil fuels. That's the role of public policy. Whether you're on the right or on the left, the role of public policy is essentially to provide those antibodies in the market economy to allow growth to continue, to allow innovation to replace fossil fuels before they get, they get scarce. So that's, the kind of, that, that's where it, it kind of comes together on the growth side. Um, what I'm gonna do very briefly here is, is outline two positions in the landscape that I think are important. Um, one in particular is important for Calgary. Um, so the first one is this is the stuff on the left. This is where I think uh, Naomi Klein sort of pitches her tent. And I've, I've made this, this point before. The problem is that one, you need a big tent in a democratic society to, to get public policy moving forward. And you don't build a big tent by asking for a revolution. The left has always been eager to act on climate. It's been the right. And the, and the sort of the, the deeply conservative, small C conservatives that don't want to act on climate because it means change. Those are the folks you need to bring into the tent to get the policies done. So the Revolution doesn't build that big tent. And of course, the other piece that it misses is that it's, it's actually missing out on the, on the more powerful forces that we have, which is private capital, big corporations. You can't rebuild the energy systems in this country and around the world without engaging with some of the biggest, baddest corporations on the planet. They built the energy system, they're capable of rebuilding it. You can't do it without those kinds of forces. So I find it sort of, it's naive in a couple of ways. But the best of this position though, is in its criticisms of laissez-faire capitalism. Laissez-faire capitalism cannot solve climate. Um, it would burn every piece of coal in the ground that was economically viable. 
uh, indeed, uh, even the pushback on private ownership of press, I think, is relevant. Rupert Murdoch has done more than any other individual on this planet to kneecap action on climate. And if Klein's target were those were limited to those critiques of capitalism around things like ownership of news media, concentration of power in the hands of a Zuckerberg and Facebook, for example, the corruption of elections, those are all legitimate issues and legitimate criticisms that we need to resolve. Capital is not more important than people's votes, but that's not a left or right thing. That's just a, a being politically honest thing. Um, so that's kind of one extreme. The other extreme are techno optimists, right? Who sort of believe, wow, we're gonna, you know, we've solved innovation before. This is the, the, the pro growth crowd. Um, we'll invent our way out of this. This is where I think things get really interesting for a place like Calgary and Alberta. I am an investor in clean tech. I am completely bullish on the sector. I think the tar sands are a dead man walking. I think they're that for economic reasons, not for any other reason. So I can be bullish as an investor on clean tech. We will replace fossil fuels with cleaner alternatives. The problem is as a human being, we're not gonna do it on a time frame that resolves climate, right? So the, the role of public policy again is not to, 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 to set up the possibility that we can replace oil. We will replace oil. Um, but it'll take longer than, than, we, than we have if you want to resolve the climate problem. So you can be an optimist and a pessimist at the same time. And this is kind of where all the, all the action is. This is the cost of solar energy. You've probably seen this on a time scale that's relevant over several decades. And if you think that fossil fuels or traditional energy sources can compete with this particular curve, which is almost vertical when you look at it on that time scale, you're dreaming. And of course, the same kind of cost curve you see on batteries, the cost of electric EVs and so on, they're coming faster and furious. And the reason for that is the following. Technology curves on cost go one way, they go down. Technology curves on performance go one way, they go up. And that combination is unstoppable once it starts to kick into gear. There's no policy, there's nothing anybody could have done to stop the mechanization of agriculture. That was gonna happen because people invented better ways of doing it, more efficient ways of doing it. You couldn't stop the digitization of communications if you wanted to. It's a better way of communicating. It's a more efficient way of communicating. And both of those revolutions were predicated on a technology cost curve. So Canada may spend a lot of time talking about pipelines and our right or obligation to burn heavy oil and defend existing jobs. We may care a lot about that and it takes up a lot of political oxygen in this country, but the rest of the world is moving on. Coming to our shores are these price curves. And, and we are selling oil in a global market that is subject to these price curves. Um, Chinese buses by themselves are now displacing three quarters of a million barrels of oil a day, and they just got started, right? These are exponential curves. So you cannot stop the solid state distributed energy revolution that's coming because it's predicated on technology and you cannot stop technology with policy. Um, the BNP Paribas, a bank out of France asked the question, what does oil need to be priced at to be competitive with electric vehicles and renewable energy at today's prices? So today's cost of wind and solar, pay for all the transmission it takes to get that into cities and charge your cars up. No price curve reduction going forward. Today's prices, the answer is between 10 and $20 a barrel. If you think Alberta is competitive in that environment, you're dreaming. Saudi's competitive in that environment, that's pretty much the only, the only group that is. Now, of course, the incumbents have the advantage of literally nearly infinite energy available instantaneously. You go fill up your car from a giant the supply chain that's been built up over 70 years around the world. And obviously, we have to build the wind and the solar to, to, to compete in terms of scale. But when people are building projects and giving the final go ahead to put the shovel in the ground on projects that last 30, 40, 50 years, they're looking at these numbers, right? It is not carbon pricing that hurt Alberta before COVID came along. It was global oil prices having to be competitive with EVs uh, and renewables. So this is coming to Calgary, whether you like it or not. The question is, how do you position yourself? So we can fight about pipelines, we can fight about climate all we want. This is coming. We may wanna get ahead of the curve uh, and figure out a way to play in this kind of economy rather than, rather than try to fight it. So that's the good news part on the technology climate side. But the bad news part is, as Vaclav Schmil has been pointing out for many, many years, um, you may have a better, faster, and cheaper uh, energy system, but it doesn't matter. It will take 50 years to replace the incumbents, 40, 40 to 50 years to replace the incumbents, and we simply haven't got that much time. So he believes we are historically determined to fail in this climate effort, regardless of the economic 
you know, picture I just gave you. But I don't think we need to go so meekly into that dark night. He, he believes we're historically determined, but that's only true in so much as the context in which this particular energy revolution takes place, takes place in the same context. So ca climate capitalism is about changing that context. So we have public policy because we need to, to produce these artificial antibodies to deal with fossil fuels before they get scarce. We need public policy in place to make sure that we're not historically determined to fail in this particular historical revolution. And in Canada, we may want uh, public policy in place to ensure we don't spend all our oxygen time and effort defending powerful, invested, incumbent industries who are defending today's jobs. And they are legitimately doing their best to defend today's jobs, but they're today's jobs. They're not tomorrow's jobs. And someone needs to represent that counterfactual. And that's the role, I think, of enlightened citizens. <laughs> And, and the public sector. So those, those are kind of the, the two bookends around, around climate. And very quickly, I'll just kind of go through what, what I mean. And I'm, I'm not gonna get into the detail of, of, these, of these policy options. They're in the book, they're sort of nerdy. I'll point at a bunch of them and then I'll kind of tail it off and let you ask me some questions. But at the end of the day, again, leave our dogma at the door and simply pick the tools that we know are most effective in solving the climate problem and that's how we build a climate capitalism that works for everybody. The first thing I'm gonna note is the need for speed. If your house is on fire, you don't give a crap about uh, the efficiency of the fire hose. What you care about is a fire hose delivers a whole lot of water really fast to where the flames are. So the idea that, that we can get out of this climate problem with, with carbon pricing, and carbon pricing is uniquely efficient, and it is, economists are right in pointing out it's the most efficient solution, that's not as important anymore. Speed is more important than efficiency, as, as I pointed out. You know, if we had you know, the world's most efficient fire hose, it's probably an Israeli designed drip irrigation system, but it doesn't save your house. If your house is on fire, you don't care if the hose leaks a little bit, you just want a lot of water. That's kind of where we are at policy now. 10, 15 years ago, this story would end and I would say price carbon, ratchet it up slowly over time. There's lots of reasons why that's the most efficient solution, the best solution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera but it isn't 10 or 15 years ago. We need very fast solutions that are politically robust. So we can think about an effectiveness versus efficiency of a solution. And we can, and we can think about its political cost and its resiliency. There's no point putting a policy in place that gets undone, right? Ontario had a great cap and trade program and it got ripped up as soon as, as Ford came into office. So what's the point of a policy that can't survive an election? And this is what Mark Jacquard keeps banging on about out there in BC. You need to have politically robust solutions and a price on carbon is not politically robust. So I think price on carbon is a wonderful thing, but we need to find other ways to short circuit our economy to put out this fire faster. And we may not care quite so much about its efficiency because it's too late for that now. So in my mind, we accelerate everything. Some ideas are we, that we build on ramps for new technologies that are capable of disrupting incumbent technologies, even things like incumbent solar. If you think about solar today, it's a $600 billion a year industry. It's like a superhighway. But every car that's on that highway was invented in roughly the 1980s. There's nothing really new under the sun. It's more efficient, it's moderately better, manufacturing techniques are different. But the solar panels that we're putting up, that's the cheapest form of new power in the world, by the way, um, was all invented in the 80s, roughly. So if we want to improve on that in terms of its fundamental efficiency, its ability to be integrated into buildings and, and all this kind of stuff, we need to think about, and same with lithium ion batteries on storage. Lithium ion crushes it on storage. It's four hours and down, but it can't go above four hours. So new battery chemistries are, are needed. But you have to compete with incumbents that have the advantage of scale. You can't go up against the Chinese solar manufacturers, and you can't go up against uh, Tesla on lithium ion batteries. So what you need are on-ramps that enable new technologies to get up to speed fast enough to get onto that, that highway. And in that sense, what Canada might want to do is we had a program called Own the Podium back in the, in, the, in the Whistler Olympics. Own the Podium got us a whole bunch of gold medals. It wasn't the government picking winners, it was the government backing winners. So athletes that showed an ability to compete at an international scale were given coaching time and all this stuff so they could, they could focus on their sport and become excellent. In the same way in clean tech, we have companies that are demonstrating the capacity to win big global markets around the world with tier one customers and so on and so forth. That for those companies, we need to build on ramps to enable them to scale much faster into global markets. That happens to be in our own economic self-interest as well as the world's environmental interest. So that's some public policy you might want to think about. Efficiency, 
Um, they are, there's probably a 40% reduction in energy use in this country that we could achieve if we could unlock energy efficiency. The challenge is, what you see here is a picture of a hotel I built in downtown Toronto. We lowered its energy use by 75% from, from business as usual, and we did it at a profit. The challenge with, with efficiency, like in that hotel, the payback was five or six years, which means that I needed to use the capital budget of that hotel for those energy retrofits, which was fine with me. I can't make that much money on that capital as I can on energy retrofit to get to 20, 30% return. But CFOs in corporations all across this country are taught that unless something is in your strategic, is, is in your strategic wheelhouse, i.e. another t-shirt machine if, you're, if you make t-shirts, uh, another hole in the ground if you drill for oil, um, unless it's for that kind of stuff, you don't tap your capital budgets, you tap your operating budgets. And so energy efficiency in pretty much every company in, in, the, in the country has to tap operating budgets because it's not strategically important. It's just energy. It's just a line item. Well, operating budgets mean you have to have a payback in 12 months. It has to pay for itself in one year. And if very few efficiency programs pay for themselves in a year, a tiny fraction of them. So this doesn't really require policy. This just requires a change in the mindset of CFOs across this country. If you saw energy spend as strategically important to your business, you would unlock your capital budgets and you would unlock all kinds of energy savings projects across your organization. And you would make more money on those projects than you do in your core business because no one makes more than 12, 16% on core equity and you make 20 to 40% on energy efficiency. So this is uh, an enormous possibility. And ideally when COVID uh, uh, gets buried again, energy efficiency retrofits across this country will be part of the economic stimulus package that we, that we pull out because it's Canadian trades, Canadian engineers, Canadian plumbers, Canadian carpenters, very hard to outsource the retrofit of a building or the energy efficiency of a, of a factory entirely offshore, which you can do with, with pure technology plays. I've talked in the past about green bonds and a green bank. There are ways to integrate the public and private sector so they get aligned on, on projects. I won't, if you want to ask me about it, you can, it's online. There's more details than warrants, uh, than, than is warranted for a brief discussion like this, but it's really a way of saying the government has the lowest risk rate in terms of cost of capital. The private sector is way better at doing due diligence and figuring out what projects are worthy of investment. And so you marry the two in a green bank backed by green bonds, which the public buy like a Canada savings bond. And that green bank has a mandate given to it by the government to reduce uh, greenhouse gases at lowest cost to the government, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a bunch of details there, but that's one way of accelerating a whole lot of shortcuts in our economy. The last thing I would note is there's lots of uh, institutions that people love to hate, people like the WTO. The WTO represents the interests of those who negotiated those agreements many years ago. I was in Seattle during the Battle of Seattle many years ago, and there are lots of legitimate complaints about the, the relative importance of the environment, social justice, and labor compared to capital. Um, but if a guy like Trump can walk into NASA, uh, into um, uh, NATO, and disrupt that institution, you think a motivated set of leaders can't walk into the WTO and, and use it as a substantial tool in leveling the playing field for climate action? The WTO has real teeth. It has, we've given up sovereignty to, to the WTO. Uh, free trade agreements are not free. There are thousands of pages of contracts that we as a country have agreed to give up sovereignty over. And so the WTO can overrule uh, national governments on certain policy issues because they've got teeth. They've got arbitration ability and so on. And so if we took the WTO and said, okay, why don't you apply those teeth to make sure every country is playing on a, on a level playing field in terms of carbon. So you can't have, you know, free trade until you embed carbon pricing on your side of the fence, or we're going to hit you with a tariff at the border. You suddenly have a, you don't have the problem of, of, of countries moving first being at any kind of disadvantage. So the point here is don't throw everything out just because you think it's a bad thing and it's associated with big, bad international capitalism maybe take those institutions and reform them because it's a lot easier and a lot faster to reform institutions than it is to try to build something from scratch. So that's kind of where I'll end it. I, I, I will point out that we're not avoiding uh, climate at this point. Uh, the Anthropocene is here. It's going to get worse. All we're trying to do is mitigate it. We all have our own, own reasons to do it. And I think one of the greatest things that we've seen happen on the, on the international sphere so far is a little girl from Sweden. Uh, because I think what Greta Thunberg has done, uh, to the surprise of everybody, is start conversations around the kitchen table in pretty much every family in the world, as far as I can tell. I don't think anybody 
uh, who has kids has avoided the conversation around the family dinner table. Uh, it's getting hot. What are you doing about it? And that includes business leaders, people that run pension funds, people who form policy, you know, all the bad guys and all the good guys are all asked, being asked by their kids what they're going to do about this. And I think that's a reason we're beginning to see a fundamental shift in corporate culture where corporate leadership in Canada in particular are open to engaging on this issue. Uh, how, how far they're going to go, that's up to us. That's up to policymakers. But the conversations I have uh, with my peers in Bay Street and so on, it's very different today than it was even two years ago. And I think it's because of this little girl. So I'll stop there and see if you have questions. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, I've got a few questions that I have ready for you here. Um, I guess, well, I'm going to start with, I, I like to ask all of my guests this. What do you think the big teachable moment is from COVID? For, so for example, for me, um, I had always been told that, you know, there's no money for this climate action or that climate action. We can never <laughs> afford that. So sorry. And it turns out that uh, if we believe the threat is real, yeah, there's money for that. We'll find it. Um, what's, what's, what teachable moment really sticks out for you? Yeah, well, unfortunately, uh, I think post-COVID, it will be true that the cupboards will be bare, right? The amount of, of, of debt that the public sector is taking on to deal with this uh, is, is mind-numbing, and we don't even know how it's going to go. So I think that story that you've heard in the past about the cupboard being bare for action on climate, you're going to hear it again, unfortunately. However, uh, I do think that the public is, is primed for a conversation about value, for a conversation about risk, and the role of leadership, both public and private, in dealing with systemic risk. Even though COVID and climate are very, very different things, I tried to kind of blend them together at the beginning of this talk as calling them both systemic risks. They're very different, but I think to the public, they're not that different. They're things you're scared of. Experts talk about it. Turns out the experts are right. And when all hell breaks loose, there's only one place you go for help. It's the public sector, right? Um, and so I think reaffirming the public sector's role as the ultimate arbiter and, and framer of action on systemic risk and the only group capable of providing a foundation for recovery from COVID means there's a lot of karma that's owed. There's a debt that's going to be owed to the public sector, who's all of us, um, by the private sector, who is going to get bailed out yet again um, after they were in 2008. And so I think the door is open for a reasonable discussion about what the role of the private sector is going to be going forward in being a full partner, not a partial partner, a full partner with the public sector in dealing with, with climate risk. And I think the public uh, has a right to ask for that. And I think they're in a mood to ask for that um, because I think the, you know, all bets are off now. Um, things change very quickly. Our psychology changed very quickly. And so I think if we take advantage of that and we are clear about the role of the public sector, the role of the private sector, the nature of systemic risk, I think the conversation can, can get amped up from where it is today. That's the opportunity. So it, it, I feel like there's going to be need for an enormous rebuild for many countries across the world, jobs programs, stimulus, et cetera, once all this is said and done. And you know, the cupboard being bare, agreed, but they're, there's, they're going to have to re-kickstart an economy. And, and I feel like there's a non-zero number of countries that are going to use that opportunity to make the shift. I also feel like um, Trudeau, the Pr Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, sounds, he's, he's sending a lot of the right messages to me. That it, that it sounds like he, he, he is, is prioritizing the right things. Certainly the message he sent to Alberta Oil and Gas uh, seems that, that he's going to be trying to promote that. Is that something you see coming? I know in your book you talk about um, like uh, in, in the World Trade Organization, but for climate kind of thing. And it, yeah. it, it, could Canada be a leader in that, do you think? Well, I, I think there's a couple of ways in which, which we might. I mean, we're hearing the right noises, but frankly, Ottawa is still dealing with, you know, day-to-day -day emergencies on COVID. They're talking about the economic recovery being driven by a green stimulus, whether they put put their money where their mouth is remains to be seen. Um, I think they're looking for ideas. I think there are some obvious ones like retrofitting our building stock and so on, which are kind of no brainers. Um, how seriously we take this opportunity, I don't know. Honestly, I, I think that 
the, the, the hit that the oil price took from COVID is a precursor. I mean, it happened very, very quickly, but it's a perfect precursor for exactly the discussion that BNP Paribas is trying to start. Long term, oil has to be 10 or $20 a barrel to be competitive with, with electrification of transport. And if you take that argument seriously, the writing's on the wall. It's just not going to happen in two years. It'll happen in 15. So I think, I think no one loves, you know, it's difficult when an economic shock happens, but that means there's something to learn from that shock. And again, what we're seeing played out in oil markets right now is a precursor for what's already coming down the pipe from, 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 from clean tech and electrification. It's just going to happen in slower motion. So it gives us an opportunity to have a conversation that's difficult to have in this country. But now we're forced to have it. Are we going to put our money on heavy oil or are, are we going to put our new money on something else? It's a reasonable discussion to be, to be had, I think. Yeah, your, your, uh, your book talks about the carbon bubble where it becomes, um, you know, it just it becomes less and less likely that investors are going to be able to get their money out of the uh, out of oil and gas. And uh, we were, were certainly seeing the prior to COVID um, big players in the, the global financial markets are starting to, to turn away from this. How much do you think COVID has influenced that bubble? I don't know that it's influenced it yet. I mean, I think, I think people make, make diff I think people were already making long-term decisions about energy that was cutting Alberta out, right? And we saw it when Equinor left, we saw it, you know, like it, it's not carbon pricing that has been the source of Alberta's woes over the past four or five years. It's been the cost of shale oil and the, and the increased dominance of EVs in China. That's a long-term trend. Investors are not stupid people. When they look at a 30 or 40 year project, which is what oil and gas projects are, these high capex things, they're looking out 30 or 40 years and they're deciding where they're gonna place their bets. And unfortunately, whether we like it or not, Alberta is the high cost producer and a high carbon producer in a low carbon world that's, that is slowly getting off oil. That's, that's, you know, that, that's, just, that's got nothing to do with Trudeau, it's got nothing to do with Kenny. These decisions aren't being made in Canada. These decisions are being made on Wall Street and in London and, and elsewhere. And so again, it's not pleasant to have a shock thrust upon you like this, but it gives you an opportunity to say, well, if the, blank, if the, if the page is really gonna be blank, what should we put on that page? And that's kind of the, that's kind of the option that we're, that we're being given. So panning back to, uh, to talk about the subject of your book, capitalism and climate, um, you know, I, I end up uh, hearing people turning their nose up at China and at, at Wuhan and the, and the wet markets and things like that. And to me, I'm, I'm all too aware that in our existing system, there's a whole bunch of wet markets. There's a whole bunch of things from, I mean, they're not wet markets, but like our oceans are unsustainable. You, when you're talking about wet markets, you might as well talk about unsustainable things that it's very predictable are going to come back and do damage to us. Right. And so what your book talks about is capitalism evolving and working with government to solve big problems. Is, the, is, is this, is this, does COVID help force that evolution? Are, are humans capable of learning from this, I guess? <laughs> well, I, I, I guess we'll see. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, you know we, we, we tend to view human progress as inevitable because we, we see progress as being something like technology or science, which I think does progress and it ratchets up, right? Science builds on a foundation and we get better at science. Scientific theory improves. Um, but that's not the same thing as social knowledge. And John Gray, uh, a philosopher out of the, the London School of Economics, talks about the myth of progress. Whereas we associate progress with the things that we see, technology and science and so on, but we're human beings. And ultimately our, 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 our ability to act collectively against problems are predicated on the strengths of the institutions that we have. And those institutions are ultimately people. And people are ultimately have the same kind of brains we had thousands and thousands of years ago. And so we tend to keep having to relearn certain lessons every generation or so, because those are the soft lessons. Those, that's the social knowledge. And that doesn't accumulate in the same way that scientific knowledge does. And so, so I don't know how we're going to react to this. I mean, I, I would like to think it's a learning moment. I would like to think there's some kind of progression in our understanding. But look what's happening south of the border. I mean, that looks very 19, 
27 to me, like yeah. 1934 to me. Right. So I don't know that, 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 we, that we progress. And our institutions seem particularly weak today, given what's happening, again, south of the border. It's a unique country and a uniquely corrupt political system. It's not what's happening here or in Europe. I mean, we have complaints about every political system, but it's not like the United States. So they're uniquely corrupt at this point. But it does show you that institutions are only as strong as the people within those institutions. And whether or not our psychology and our, and, our, and our level of social engagement and ability to solve problems together collectively has improved, it remains to be seen. I think it's an open question. Um, fair enough. Uh, so if Canada does decide to take this opportunity to, uh, you know, to, uh, for rebuild, to, to rebuild in the direction of low carbon transition, et cetera, what what sorts of things would you like yeah, would you like to them to put into place? I know you've talked about green banks and bonds. I'm a fan of the PACE program. Are there some things that stick out to you that, that you feel like that would be a good thing for him to do? Yeah. Well, I, I so th there's a lot of people that work that do good work on things like PACE bonds and building retrofits and so on. And I think that's that's a big lift in terms of immediate economic stimulus. I think you couldn't do any better than retrofitting our building stock, for example. I mean, you could do, yeah, that's a 10 year massive employment project that has nothing but economic gain because you lower the amount that you spend on energy and everybody would spend that money on something else, right? Businesses and people. So I think that's where the heavy lifting should be in terms of direct economic stimulus. What I'm more interested in is the long-term economic strategy that allows us to build jobs for the next generation. And in that, I'm pretty clear. The biggest single market of the 21st century is clean tech. It is selling the technology that allows other countries as well as ourselves to lower their emissions and to do so at a profit. Right now, if you buy a solar panel, it's from China. China has had a very specific long-term strategic decision to own the solar market. And they did that by putting a lot of cheap capital, not into solar farms, but into solar manufacturing facilities. And they said, those solar manufacturing facilities don't even really have to make a profit. Just break even, don't even pay me back the loans, but employ a whole lot of people. And that was what their strategic vision was, and they've got it done. They're doing the same now to electric cars. There's 600 electric car companies in China. I think Canada has an opportunity to think really hard about, well, what's our role going to be 10, 15 years from now? And we are very good at innovation. We do have some of the top dogs in the energy storage race, next generation solar, next generation biofuels, whole lot of solid state electronics, AI, AI driving efficiency. There's a ton of innovation that we do in this country that if we get it right and we position ourselves, own the podium, to sell that technology to the rest of the world at scale and we selectively provide capital and growth for those companies, that market is massive. And if all Canada got was our pro rata share of the clean tech market, like 2%, which is our, our population percentage. I mean, I mean, that's what you get for showing up. That's house league, right? You get your pro rata share. There's no reason we couldn't get double or triple our pro rata share if we think. Even if all we got was a pro rata share, our clean tech industry would be bigger than our automotive sector. That's the stakes at play here while we sit and argue about pipelines. There are far bigger fish to fry and far bigger markets to go after than our ability to sell heavy oil. Um, similar to that previous question, I, I have a number of friends here in, in Calgary and Alberta wide who are, are talking about building an Alberta New Deal, where, we're the, where we, we get ourselves off of being dependent on the oil and gas. Oil and gas does what it does, but we're looking to do other things. What, what, what would be low hanging fruit, do you think, for this province if they were looking to do, to divest and, and, and start doing new and different innovation? Well, to be honest, I, I think only Albertans can answer that question. I mean, yeah. entrepreneurs, it's, it tends to be a, a networked phenomenon. You, you take advantage of the skill sets that you find around you, which in Alberta, what we know is engineering and financial engineering. I mean, there's a you know, ton of really bright people in Alberta. You know, by the way, oil and gas isn't the enemy. Oil and gas got us here. Right? So yep. it's not about good or bad. It's about you know, empirical evidence of how long does that, does that ride going to continue for. Um, and I think if you leverage the engineering expertise, the ability to uh, access global markets, the ability to build big projects, I mean, there's a ton of talent. And I think you just wait to see what, you just put the right signals in place. You value the output. 
the economic output of, of, of clean tech and you see what people come up with. Final question I have for you before we go to our panelists um, is uh, you, you have the, uh, the quote from the famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass says power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. You also say incumbents don't disrupt, they get disrupted. They're too busy making money. So during this time, I noticed amongst the climate community, it seems to be a, we're, we're a little quiet right now. And it's like we're all sort of adapting to this moment. But I also feel it's an enormous moment and opportunity for climate. And we better be loud and loud soon. What, what, what advice could you give to the Climate Hub, peop, people like me and, and, and like yourself, to, uh, to be able to take advantage of this moment to get the, the, the initiatives we need in place? Uh, there's no magic bullet to that. I mean, I, democracy is a contact sport. Um, it's not showing up to the booth once every four years and putting an X on a piece of paper. It is uh, contacting, mobilizing, talking, phoning, and in particular, letting the, both the opposition and the governments uh, that that is action that you support. Um, in particular, the opposition, right? I mean, the opposition sits there waiting to, to, put a, to pull a, to pull a, a target on the back of anybody who's, who's aggressive on climate as they did in Ontario, I think the opposition needs, needs to know that that's not a vote winner. Um, and I, there's been some polling done. Diana Carney, uh, a couple of years ago, did a poll across every single party across the country and a majority of every single party, the constituents of every single party from the PCs over to the Greens wanted action on climate and supported a price on carbon. And so it's only a, a wedge issue in the, the equivalent of primaries, the leadership races. Um, a majority of people in Ontario wanted cap and trade. Um, Doug Ford won because people were just tired of the liberals. And so he took that as a mandate to rip up cap and trade. Um, it was internal to the PC party that that needed to be stopped in its tracks. And so I think the most effective vote any of us has is in electing the leaders of parties. So I would join a party uh, and I would make sure that party understands that this, is, that this is a priority, whether it's on the right or the left. That, that's, I think, where the real work happens. Because in selecting that leader, you're essentially selecting the policy platform. And that's the most powerful vote you have. I mean, how many people elected Boris Johnson? 100,000? Now he's the Prime Minister of Britain. It was, yeah. the, it was the membership of the, of the Conservative Party that voted in Boris Johnson before he had mm -hmm. that election. And that's who voted Doug Ford as the, as the leader of the PC Party. And they were going to win that election whether they ran a dog catcher or not. Right. I mean, right. the, the Liberals had 17 years. They were done. Yeah. So it is, it is inside political parties that real action happens. So join a political party and get your elbows up. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I'm going to just, uh, before we get to our panelists, I'll just mention our sponsors. Uh, Skyfire Energy has been designing and installing solar PV systems for homeowners, business owners, utilities, municipalities, and First Nations since 2001. They're an employee-owned certified B Corporation with offices in Calgary, Edmonton, Penticton, and Regina. Their staff is one of the most experienced and qualified teams in the industry, having completed many of the largest and most complex solar projects in Western Canada. Their vision is to bring the magic of solar power to the world for a stronger, healthier, and more sustainable global community. If you'd like to get your, I'd also should mention, if you'd like to get your hand on, hands on Tom's book, The Case for Climate Action, you can order it from his website at tomran.net. That's tomran.net. We've made a uh, link to it in the, uh, in the chat. And I understand there's also copies available at Owl's Nest Bookstore on Elbow Drive. So, you know, it's a good time to help those, uh, those local businesses better now than ever. Uh, okay, so this is our, our Q&A session. We're going to borrow a page from Canada's Prime Minister and allow our questioners both a question and a follow-up question. We'll take questions by the Zoom Q&A function and from our Facebook Live feed as well. So post those up and we'll see, uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, our first up is Jared Bluestein, who runs an employee-owned vegetarian restaurant called The Allium. I hope I'm saying that right, The Allium. Liam, he'll correct me, in downtown Calgary. Uh, so we're posting a link in the chat. They're open for delivery and pickup. And once again, let's support those local businesses. Uh, he also is, runs the Open Streets events, which uses bicycle power to power events. And they've been a critical part of, my, uh, of the Calgary Climate Hub's uh, community climate conversations. So uh, Jared, take it away. Thanks, Steve. And hello, Tom. Very nice to digitally meet you. 
Um, I should just point out really quick that with Open Streets, uh, we've also actually just started a huge collaboration with local uh, energy companies. So we're really trying to promote uh, local, cooperative, uh, community-owned green energy companies um, at all the events that we go to. Um, I kind of have to say that what Steve's asked us to do here is a bit of an impossible task. Um, on the one hand, kind of distilling all my inquiries and concerns and questions um, that I have for you into sort of one or two major points is uh, a bit of a practice in futility, uh, maybe bordering on reductionism, but I will do my best. Um, on the other hand, I also don't know that we have a collectively agreed upon uh, definition of capitalism here. And so uh, I find it really difficult to really explore these topics uh, without a collective uh, definition. Um, but again, um, I will do my best. Um, I, I do agree a lot with what you're saying, Tom. I just need to point out um, that you choose the term capitalism, and I don't think that this is a bi bipartisan or nonpartisan term. I think that this is a charged term that carries a lot of weight with it. And so to say that we're transcending sort of this left-right divide, um, I, I don't think is necessarily honest. Um, and at the same time, uh, you seem to make Naomi Klein kind of this caricature of the left that you're trying to attack on these issues of environmentalism. Um, I would urge you to explore a lot of other uh, great uh, uh, theor theorists and thinkers on the left um, who talk a, a lot about these issues and not just in a ruptural, transformative way. Uh, one that I can think of is Eric Olin Wright, uh, wrote a beautiful book called Real Utopias, who talks about the uh, interconnection between uh, interstitial, symbiotic, and ruptural forms of transformation. Ruptural being that sort of, uh, you know, revolutionary form you keep bringing back. Um, the goal that you're obviously talking about here is implementing market-oriented solutions for climate issues. And I think that's both commendable and more importantly, it's practical. It is a effective and immediate way to start addressing some of these issues. But if I might play the role of the critic a little bit here, um, I think that this perspective perhaps glosses over or fails to address the for-profit model and culture of consumption that drives much of the current climate crisis that we're currently in. Um, some of your solutions are policy dependent, and I need to point out that both our provincial and federal government have recently invested billions of dollars in pipelines. Um, hey, Jared, we're going to have to get to a question. I'm sorry. It's coming right up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to do it. Got it. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess ultimately uh, what I'm trying to say is I agree with you. Let's not critique. Let's create. Um, and let's use data-driven ideas for that. But the data does show increasing wealth stratification from our current socioeconomic system. Um, it shows that people are concentrating power and wealth. To assume that that will be glossed over by creating market solutions is problematic. And so I guess what I'm ultimately really asking you is, um, if the medicine is potentially as toxic as the disease, should we keep administering it? How can we claim that capitalism can help cure this very issue without really giving credence to all of the broader issues and the broader uh, stratifications and pollution and colonialism, all of these things um, that, that it's also helped to create? Um, to me, it seems uh, to gloss over a lot of the intricacies of this issue. No, fair enough. Um, and I, I certainly owe you a definition of capitalism, which I do, I do have in the book, and it's roughly, um, you know, the role of private capital, for profit, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So there is, there, I, I agree you need a working definition. Um, but the, but, that's, but the, the conflation of an economic system in, in and again, I don't know what, what the alternative to market forces are, right? If, if one, so I, I would sort of put it back to you and say, well, if market forces aren't there, what's there? Um, and, and what is it that you're actually asking the population to vote for? I mean, that, that, that's, that, I mean, we have 10 to 15 years left to put a cork in emissions. So however valid one may feel a revolution is and how many interconnected problems one may think can be solved by replacing the economic system with another, I would first ask, well, what's the other economic system? And second, what is the actual, what are you going to get, what are you going to ask people to vote for? And if you, can, if you can articulate something that will, people will vote for, that's fine. I, I'll take that as a, as, a, as, a, as a net positive. But I think we've been talking about La Revolution for a very, very long time. And I just don't think it's a, I don't think it's a vote getter, frankly. Uh, and in the next 10 or 15 years, 
we've got maybe three more rounds of government. Um, so again, I, you're right that while I don't do justice to the, the complexities of what other ramifications of capitalism might entail, but at the same time, I'm like, well, you know, Sweden is a capitalist country. It has market forces, it has private capital. Um, I don't think we've even stress tested how far we can go in that direction before we start talking about having all ills of economic activity righted. <laughs> okay, um, so um, Jared, we took up a little time with that question. If you have a quick response or a quick answer, then, uh, then let her buck. Yeah, um, I do. Am I, sorry, am I being broadcasted? Yep. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Yes, I absolutely do. Um, so I would just point out, for instance, markets aren't necessarily the defining feature of capitalism. Uh, I've opened a non-capitalist worker-owned cooperative. Uh, we call it a form of market socialism. Um, so that is definitely a solution or one option. And I would just maybe suggest um, focusing more on co-ops and credit unions. Um, that could be something people could start voting for. If we actually amalgamate the spending power, the purchasing power, the understandings of the average working class or, or general people, um, and we, we sort of compile that, that revenue, that capital to invest in community-owned energy systems, that could be a great answer. If we, instead of using green bonds at private banks, but start supporting credit unions, again, we start to separate from that, that single owner private uh, for-profit model, and we start including other considerations such as community ownership, environmental considerations. Fair enough. Do you want, is there anything you want to respond to there, Tom? No, I think those are all great ideas, and there's certainly room for all of that within climate capitalism. I think that's a friendly amendment. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so thank you for your question there, Jared. And again, everybody, uh, you know, support his local business. That's, that's something that we'd really like to see happen. Um, our next guest is on deck. Uh, her name is Mackenzie Cummings. She is one of the Fridays for Future kids. Uh, so she is out uh, on, a, on a Friday afternoon. In fact, I, I like to tell the story about our brave, you know, it's one thing for me being a Calgary climate activist and being an adult, but these kids out there every Friday, uh, they were out in minus 30 degree weather and um, we're really proud of them and we wanted to give them a platform here. Uh, so I see that she's up there. We'll just get her to unmute and, uh, and off we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, hello. Um, so my question is kind of, well, I don't, it's really to uh, climate capitalism, that's about all I have to say. But recently many climate action lobby groups have been promoting a rather socialist Green New Deal as being better, both better for the planet and providing uh, prosperity and equality for our most vulnerable, vulnerable populations like ethnic minorities, LGBTQ+, and um, people living in poverty. Um, in a climate capitalism society, how would we assure that these most vulnerable populations are still supported financially? Would it be done better than it is currently or would we keep the same status quo of quote of neglect that we currently have? Um, it, it's up to us. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm separating the climate problem from every other problem. I mean, that, that's, one of the, that's one of the main points I'm making is that it's why the LEAP manifesto a couple of years ago I found was interesting. It was a grab bag of every concern the left had, including climate, and that was bundled up as the climate solution. And again, my, and I have no problem with trying to solve I have no issue with trying to solve those problems, but lumping them all in together doesn't build a big democratic tent. So I'm saying climate can be a separate issue. We can put a cork in emissions uh, and still have a whole bunch of other things to do to make our world a better place. But the idea that we're designing an economic system that automatically solves all ills is exactly what I'm saying is not a practical uh, uh, electable platform. Um, yeah, so I agree with that. And I was just wondering if the kind of the climate capitalism idea is, is trying to tackle all of them, but you uh, no, it's, clear it's that not, up very easily. Not, I guess. But, but again, it, it, all, it all depends on how you, how you implement it. There's, there's, no, there's nothing irreconcilable about climate capitalism and not solving issues of social justice. They're separate issues. You can build a climate capitalist uh, world and try to solve those issues at the same time, or you can ignore them. 
um, that's up to people. Um, but I'm really separating out climate and saying, look, if we don't get climate right, there's no point talking about these other issues because you know, in a Mad Max four degree world, all the work we've been doing on all those other issues will get washed away. I am saying it is the single most important systemic risk that we face and we need to find a way to put a cork in emissions. And if that means reaching across the aisle and forming agreements with people from the other political spectrum who don't agree with everything else that you think is important, we need to do exactly that. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yes. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, again, and anybody who's listening, anybody who can hear my voice, support Fridays for Future, support those brave kids who are out there uh, fighting every Friday. Um, um, our next uh, next panelist, our last panelist, and then we'll have a question or two. How are you? How are you doing for time there, Tom? Are you okay? I'm good. Okay, great. Um, so our next panelist, his name is Matt Grace. Uh, guy after your own heart. He knows a lot about um, uh, building retrofits and green buildings, etc. He's also a new co-chair of the Calgary Climate Hub. Uh, so we're happy to have him in here and asking a question. Take it away, there, Matt. Hi, Tom. I love the, uh, the, your speak. I found it very inspiring. And I think it's really important that we maintain uh, an atmosphere that we, we can do things amongst in the face of this uh, catastrophe and the climate we're facing. Um, my question is going to be much simpler than the other two. And I'm really interested in your perspective on uh, carrots and sticks and the mixture of both. You know, legislation compared to incentives. So you will have probably built your hotel during the time of the, the FIT program in Ontario, and where that fits in this kind of uh, in the role of of getting us a green future. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's a single answer to that. I mean, I think uh, the government's going to be out of carrots, unfortunately, after COVID. So I think the notion of subsidizing activity uh, is not a policy that will find a lot of traction unless it's directly related to job creation, for example. Like that's why building retrofits, I think is probably the single most important thing we can do because that's direct stimulation. It just happens to save, to save energy. So to me, that's the, that's the kind of the no, the no brainer of a, of a response. Um, but at the end of the day, I, like there is enormous amounts of private capital that are not being put to use, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I actually think sticks, it sounds like it's a negative thing, but if you put guidelines in place, capital will figure out a way to solve those problems. And it's not like we're not awash in cash. We're just not awash in public cash right now. Um, so I, I see no, I, I don't see a limit to the kinds of things that we might need to do, including if you need to nationalize an oil industry to force it to sort of have a glide path to zero carbon, that's perfectly fine too. I don't, I don't, see, any, I don't see any necessarily limits to the kinds of sticks we might want to bring out to bear. But I think long before you do that, um, the, the ways to find it, ways to point out that it's in someone's self-interest to go in the direction you want them to go, I think is the, way, is the way we do this. And this is exactly what we're not doing in Canada. We're having this long discussion about preserving incumbent jobs. And I, I get that. I, I, for the workers, I totally get it. But for the companies, it's like, you've known about the macroeconomic conditions of oil for the past 25 years, and you as a corporate leader have a fiduciary responsibility to look out for those risks. Your investors are all grownups. Um, I, I don't have any sympathy for investors that lose their shirt because they made the wrong bet in a, in a world that's going low carbon. So I think those kinds of sticks are pretty clear. Um, we're all grownups, we all made our bets. If you made the wrong bet, too bad. Um, so I think that, that kind of stuff is, is pretty clear. I think you wanna protect workers who, who are going to where the jobs are. So I think once you put those kind of guidelines in place, capital will move where it needs to move. It will protect itself and it will get whatever job it needs to get done. And there's enormous amounts of capital in this world. Um, you just need to put the framework in place so that that capital wants to go where you want it to go. Yeah, I, I completely agree. My quick follow-up is um, here in Alberta, we had a solar incentive program and uh, Skyfire was sharing the numbers of how the increase in solar companies went with that incentive. And then when the current government removed the incentive, we've now got a bunch of people who are having to lay people off. Um, I'm also interested in how we levelize the playing field so that it actually becomes the obvious thing to do to, to, to do those retrofits. Pace has net been- Net metering. Oh, net metering, definitely. Just net metering. Yeah. Yeah, so it's cheap enough now that if you net meter it, uh, you don't need incentives. Yeah, yeah. So my, I guess my follow-up question 
as you mentioned pace and pace has been there, there's a couple of real strong advocates doing good work here what would be the one in, what would be the one measure that you would put in place to to pace bonds help? for geothermal pace, pace for bonds for geothermal yeah because geothermal is uniquely efficient but it also has a long payback especially on the residential side so okay. you could start with multi multi-unit residential and you have low cost of carbon attached to that building where you build a ground loop and the thermal the therms from that ground loop are shared amongst the amongst that those units okay um and you put it on a pace bond geothermal is pretty hard to get done i invested in a geothermal company and it always worked but the payback was so long and people were like i'm not going to be in my house long enough so i think solar panels net metering will do it they're cheap enough now um Storage, I don't know that people need storage just yet. Um, they'll do it because they want resilience. But I think geothermal uniquely needs a policy push because the payback is long enough that, that, that people don't want to take on that capital expense, certainly not in a house. So if you attach it to the house, put it on the property tax bill, watch the net tax bill go down, I think that's a perfect incentive where everybody wins. And that's, again, that's where the government plays a unique role. It's not putting any, any, any real money out the door. It's simply putting the loan out the door on the backs of a property tax, which is future tax revenue. Um, okay. I, so I, I wish I had a follow-up follow -up question. Sure. But I wish I did, but we don't have the time for that. But I'll, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Matt. Um, I have a question from Facebook Live from Chris Kozak. He's asking uh, if you have any comment on Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics. I haven't read it yet. I need to read that. Yeah, I think there's a TED Talk video. We'll, we'll post that link in the chat. It's worth checking out. Um, another question from Facebook Live, Patrick Duke. Uh, he says, hi to you. And it says, in this time of economic recovery, what, what else can the federal government do strategically to move capital towards climate action? Uh, price on carbon. I mean, the, the policy levers are not, are not unknown, right? Um, and it's always, you know, uh, people always want you to come up with a new policy that solves all the problems. There is no magic bullet. There's a price on carbon. There's a regulatory, there's building codes, for example, would be really important. So the real, the real grind on policy is, is the real grind on policy. There is no um, glamorous single solution that solves this. There's a whole bunch of little things that, that work. And I think in Canada, a lot of it will be industry by industry because we can put a price on carbon out there, but politically, we can't get that price of carbon high enough to really change behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Again, the price on carbon is not what is changing Alberta's economic situation. It is the price of oil. And so yeah, I think to sort of be able to change the efficiency side on figuring out what products they want to sell side, I think it's, on, it's, it's regulatory. So no one ever lost an election over a building code. But if you change building codes, you would change forever the energy intensity of buildings. So I think the work is in the details. It's in the details of a green bank. It's in the details of a regulatory approach. It's in the details of a clean fuel standard, the details of how you roll out EVs and support EV infrastructure. Um, so it's a lot of details and the, and the heavy lifting is kind of behind the scenes. Okay, I, uh, I think we're going to wrap it up there, Tom. Thank you so much for coming on here. Uh, I, I really feel like uh, yours is an important voice to have here. I've, there's, there's, there's been a few folks here who would, who would like to see capitalism get thrown out with, uh, you know, with the, with the, what do they say, with the, with the bathwater. Um, but, uh, you know, I found your book very helpful in, in understanding the interplay between government and, and business that has to happen uh, uh, for that. Um, so once again, thank you so much, Tom, for, for coming on. You're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. So that's it for this week's A Climate of Change. Uh, once again, if you'd like to get your hands on Tom's book, The Case for Climate Action, you can order it from his website at tomran.net. And, one, and as I mentioned before, you can get copies at the Owl's Nest bookstore on Elbow Drive. Support local, support local, support local. Next week's guest is Indigenous rights and climate justice advocate Ariel Deranger, executive director of the Indigenous Climate Action Organization. If you want to participate in the Zoom broadcast, be sure to sign up for a hub membership between now and then. If you liked this A Climate of Change Thursday night broadcast, we want you to know it wouldn't be possible without our excellent sponsor, Skyfire Energy. They paved the way for solar in Western Canada, and they'll certainly be a big part of our future. 
I should also thank my home, the Calgary Climate Hub. Uh, anybody that feels overwhelmed by climate and uh, and and in, in worried about it, I can only tell you from my own personal perspective, I feel you. And the best way that you can get rid of that feeling is to join other people like you, especially smart people around a table geared towards making bona fide change. Um, and that's the Calgary Climate Hub. You can also, uh, if, if, if time is at a is, is, is something you don't have a lot of, then we also could use some funding. It's not an easy, easy dollar uh, running a climate organization out of Calgary, you can imagine. Uh, so if you go to calgaryclimatehub.ca, which we'll include in the chat, um, you can sign up for, for, uh, to become a member uh, or you can just donate. I would also want to thank my volunteers, Shay, uh, Joan, as well as Paul, who gave me some sound help. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for tuning in. Um, I guess all I have to say is thank you. Let's get to work.